Welcome to E3 2014, everybody. My name is Christopher Thomas Plant. I am here with my friend Megan Farukmanesh, and we are here to talk about Lara Croft, the Temple of Osiris. Actually, Lara Croft and the Temple of Osiris, and I have no one better here to talk with us about it than Scott Amos, the executive producer at Crystal Dynamics. How are you doing today? Living the dream. Thank you for coming by our little home away from home. Fantastic. With the creepy pool. I mean, this is just... This is great, man. It's Come something. It's it a little really... off the show floor, nice and quiet. So you can hang out and just chat about it. It's good. Yeah. For those uh, who are at home, he is generally surrounded by the thundering bass of a thousand yes. sound systems. Yes. Uh, so it's a little more chill out here. Um, we have some footage of the game that we're going to kind of hop into. Absolutely. Uh, to start off, you can kind of just tell us a little bit about the game. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the sequel to Lara Croft and the Guardian of Light. So that was something we did back in 2010 as kind of a way to relaunch and reconnect fans with Lara Croft. It was something that Crystal wanted to do, both from the studio side, but also from a fan side. We want to be able to say, hey, here's Lara in her classic arcade nostalgic look. You know, dual pistols, the teal top, putting her back in that action arcade platforming. So that was 2010. Look, four years later, as you know, as a studio, we got a little focused on Tomb Raider and rebooting that in 2013. We had the definitive edition earlier this year. But the fans have been asking us for a sequel since Guardian came out. We're like, okay, we got to do something about this. And the studio wanted to do something about it. And then fans have been asking us for something set in ancient Egypt. We're like, okay, this starts to line up pretty nicely with getting the fan love and fa fan affection. So we said a setting for Lara Croft, taking that arcade action, putting it in ancient Egypt. And that led us to saying, okay, what kind of story do we want? So we started looking through mythology that we'd already explored in previous Tomb Raiders and saying, what else is out there in ancient Egypt is something we could take as this tale, which is where Osiris came up. So the idea of getting this god king and all of the mythology that goes with that as the setting, as the canvas we can put the game on. And we put that all together and now we get to show it to the world. So Guardian of Light was one of my favorite games the year it came out. Excellent to hear. By far. Um, and, Thank you. And the most recent Tomb Raider reboot was also fantastic. But I was uh, almost kind of sad about that because I thought, We'll never see a sequel to Guardian of Light. Oh, yeah. This is a big game, it's successful, and then, lo and behold, this came out. How did you get two games going at the same time? Oh, yeah, that's a really, I mean, honestly, we had to get the right amount of people in the right places, right? Because they're both critically important franchises to us. Certainly, you've seen the love that goes into it. We announced Rise of the Tomb Raider earlier this week, which you know, got another great buzz. And then that one-two punch of having Lara Croft and the Temple of Osiris right after that, Fans look at this like, oh, who's building which game? Like, Crystal's building both games. And that meant we added people, we put the teams in the right places, we brought back a lot of the original Guardian guys, and that came from, instead of a two-player game, let's push it to four-player. Let's figure out the things that we can do to push ourselves. And people were shocked by it, because they know we're a small studio of craftsmen, of senior people. But for us, it's that labor of love, so it was just, it was time. It was the right time for us to be able to divide and conquer into those franchises. Sure. One of the things I loved about uh, Guardian also was this sense of scale, where yeah. it's like your characters are obviously much smaller on screen, and you'd have these moments where you would climb your way to the top of the stage, and then you could see the entire stage basically down below. Yep. Is that something that you're trying to like recreate in this game? We are, for sure. We actually have the tombs themselves, or some of the footage you're seeing here is one of the first levels of the temple itself, the Temple of Osiris itself, that's been corrupted by his evil brother Seth. And there's some really good story elements in there, but this is kind of that classic get started, get people into it, spikes and traps and dangers and everything. You have to work together cooperatively to get through it. But we actually have an overworld as well, something that Guardian didn't have, which was basically a series of linear tombs that were massive and amazing. For us, we took that idea and spread it out to have tombs, but also you have to be outside in Egypt, have to be able to see the big pyramid back there. So we have this kind of larger scale, this larger space that you get to explore. So we have those beautiful vistas of what's this giant valley? Is that the Nile down there? What is that? So we have some really great clips you can even see in the trailer of some of those larger spaces that, yeah, we definitely want to bring back that sense of depth and scale. Very cool. So Scott, can you tell us a little bit about the new characters we're going to see in this game? Yeah, absolutely. So we have four characters in this game split into two different classes. We have the archaeologist class being Lara and Carter. Carter Bell is a new character that we wrote into the fiction saying we want to have somebody who's kind of a competitor for Lara, but also now forced to be a partner. So we have Carter and Lara as the archaeologists. They're about the grapple, which we brought back from Guardian. They actually have all the different weaponry and guns they can get, but we also gave them a dynamic torch, you know, a flare or a torch, depending on which character, which you can use to light your way. It actually looks really cool on high def and next gen having the kind of dynamic lighting, but you also use it to solve puzzles and actually to light up. Some of these tombs are pitch black, like literally you need the light source to get in there. So that's the one class. And then the other class is actually these two Egyptian gods, Isis and Horus, the wife and son of Osiris, that have actually been imprisoned in this temple for a long time until Lara and Carter show up. 
they take the curse on themselves. Now you have this four-person team who's trying to fight and work together to beat Set. So now you have two Egyptians. And the Egyptians are more of our magical class, right? They get to use the staff of Osiris. You'll see some things in here like the character puts on this large magic shield that can actually deflect any kind of incoming projectiles. You can actually climb on top of it. They can also push people off of cliffs with it because there's a little bit of that kind of competitive cooperative spirit in, in a game like this. But certainly we have kind of the magic Egyptian class and then we have the more physical archaeologist class. Um, one of the other things I enjoyed about Guardian was, uh, since it had a bit of a sense of humor, it had characters who weren't in Tomb Raider, like maybe my favorite characters from Legacy of Cain. Is that something that you're even considering for this? That's uh, a great idea. <laughs> is it a great idea? I was just, I'm just saying that maybe like if Legacy of Cain showed up in the game, that would be, you know, it'd be okay. We listen to our fans, so wow, the more fans you let us know that, we will absolutely... That's great to hear. Now I'm going to have to badger news. everyone on the internet to badger you. <laughs> right. so. Send us your, your favorite request. We'll absolutely consider it. So. Congratulations. Exactly. Um, what was the decision to go four-player versus this is uh, two from the previous game. For us, it was the looking at what we did on Guardian, which was so much fun with two-player, right? We just loved that experience of two people on a couch or online being able to you know, play together and cooperate together. We needed to push ourselves. We wanted to push because we always like growing what we can do from a technology side. We like growing just the experiences we can deliver. And looking at four-player, particularly on next-gen consoles, you know, keeping that fidelity, keeping that quality bar, but adding in those extra characters gives a broader range of play possibilities. Since the game does change, depending on one, two, three, or four players, you can play through the entire thing as single player, you can play with four people, you can be on the couch like this, and we can have a fourth friend call in from home. But being able to have that diversity, we can get more people playing and sharing that adventure together. So for us, it was really about how do we get more people connected? Because we think that kind of co-op experience needs to be shared. Sure. Um, the tone on these games is obviously a little bit different, kind of I just, just said. Just a little but bit. From, from the other versions of Tomb Raider, uh, does it take place in the same mythos, or is this still from like the classic Tomb Raider pre-reboot? Yeah, so it's definitely looking at this, you know, we think of it as one large franchise, right? Tomb Raider, Lara Croft, it's her world overall. This is kind of the arcade classic take on it. So this is certainly the more mature Lara. She's actually been through a bunch of adventures. Even the opening, there's actually a storybook that she told from Guardian where she opens it, looks at her journal and her notes. Same thing we do here, which actually she starts with, here's the myth of Osiris, and here's what that legend looks like. So this is Lara's kind of installments and adventures that she's taking in her kind of future self, if you will. Sure. Whereas certainly Tomb Raider and Rise of the Tomb Raider is all about the origin tale of Laura. It's kind of that grittier, darker version of her history and her starting point. So. And you guys yeah. have been very specific about keeping those separate. So you have yes. you know, Tomb Raider versus Laura Croft. Um, why is that distinction so important to you? I think there's just certain types of stories we want to tell, right? From the arcade side, getting four people on a couch, it's hard for us to tell a very emotionally gripping, oh my gosh, the origin tale of the four of us are trying to blow each other off of a cliff with, right. with bombs. So this is that excuse for the fun arcade action. On the other side, that very personal, very emotionally driven story where you have Lara and you have all these bizarre circumstances that she has to fight through, including just what we've kind of teased out in Rise of the Tomb Raider's trailer. You know, that to us is a different type of hook where it gets you into that really deep story and understand the roots of this character. And I think that storytelling is captured as well. So we really wanted to appease both sets of fans, people who love the puzzle arcade action element. It's classic. It's been around for 18 years. The franchise has been there, but still having puzzles and tombs, but in that different kind of captivating story way for Rise of the Tomb Raider. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, oh, sorry. I, I just want to, I want to dwell on this as a hardcore obsessive fan. <laughs> you're you're but but I, I like to imagine in this world, if this is the same Lara Croft, right now we see her like in therapy, right? Because she went and killed a whole bunch of people. <laughs> right. Now, her older self, she's so jaded <laughs> that she's being chased by a giant crocodile monster and she's like, just another day. Dude, she's gone <laughs> through, <laughs> she's you, gone. you know the adventures, right? If you go back to the beginning of the franchise and the stuff she has dealt with and the gods she has faced, even from Guardian, where you have Totec, this Mayan god that she had to deal with there. I mean, she has seen quite literally things that nobody else has seen. <laughs> stuff that people think are myth or legends, she has actually discovered them and went from fantasy to reality to being part of that actual myth <laughs> and legend now. So going from where I was to where I need to be lets us you know, even ramp the storylines more and more dramatically and even more, shall we say, epic. Even sure. things like this at the end, like, yeah. you know, this, this is one of those moments where Lara's facing Kepri, right? This giant sun god beetle. Like, where else are you going to get that? You know, this gold-plated yeah. giant creature. That's an arcade classic right there of having four people gang up against the boss. At that moment, she was thinking back to her first thing, and she's like, it wasn't so bad. Yeah, she's kind of like, no, I survived that. I'm okay. It's probably the beetle that I should be worried about. <laughs> that's right. So, so that's the benefit of having that, that style, right? Of having that too. And it even looks different, right? Looking at our Lara, even from the voice, you know, we have Keely Haas back as the 
voice of Lara Croft for us. So you know, just separating that out from both emotional and storytelling to say, this is the crazy fun, go nuts, have these giant skyscraper-sized bosses versus the kind of grittier origin tale from the other side. Sure. Yeah, that's actually kind of what I wanted to ask, that just that you have these two very different Lara Crofts with like, it's almost like split personalities. It's the same person, kind of. Yeah. So different. Yeah, we look at, I mean, from film, graphic novels, even TV shows, you can think of any major franchise and all kinds of different characters, and they'll have slightly different takes on them, but you always know, I know that superhero as this version of it, or that one's supposed to be in tights versus a bulletproof outfit, or whatever it is. So you can even look at, you know, any of the big Marvel series, you know, they've done a lot of these things where they have slightly different takes, but in the same world, but the fans know, oh, that's, that's Laura Croft, and this is her version here, and this is her version there. Mm -hmm. So I think we have, I think we have a very clear understanding that people aren't, oh, why isn't she emotionally distressed when she's being chased by a beetle? Like, this is Laura who's been through all of that muck. She knows what's out there now, and she's actually getting used to it. And this is the, the excuse to go crazy and have fun. Sure. This is a, kind of a weirdly niche question. Okay. But one of the things I've loved about Square Games recently, and specifically like Tomb Raider uh, or even Sleeping Dogs, is their PC versions are gorgeous. Yeah. Like, they look absolutely incredible. I'm curious if you can speak to, like, where does that support come from? Because you don't see that from a lot of publishers. You don't see yeah. them supporting things like that. Well, we that. think the PC fans, I mean, are very hardcore. We love supporting them because these are folks that have always stuck with it. They are, they are tried and true waving that flag, like console schmonsel. We've got PCs, we've got this, we've got our four, big, you know, four gig video cards. So for us, we love putting the experience wherever we can. As long as it looks and plays great on those platforms, we'll deliver it everywhere. So Nixies has been a longtime partner. We've had them involved with us for since the legacy of Kane days, actually. So you know, those, that's one of those groups who know our technology very well. They've actually been supporting us across the board for all of our technologies. And they're one of those teams that we look to of, hey, help us to make this thing look great on the right platforms. Then that's, that's what we do. We just love supporting people where they want to play, however they want to play. Now, Megan is very good at video games. I'm very <laughs> bad at video games. Is there a way in this game that I can be a troll to ensure that I somehow get to the end of the game before she does? I you have to carry the team, basically. Basically, that, nice. what I'm trying to say is one person is definitely going to carry the team. I like it. So I think that's absolutely one of the benefits of a co-op experience like this, where you are partnered together, but you can still mess with each other. You both have bombs. You can actually see them very clearly on the ground. So if you step inside of the radius of the bomb, you're probably going to get smashed by it. So you can actually drop a bomb in front of her and stop her from getting the loot before you. If you happen to be the archaeologist character with the grapple, if she's walking across your tightrope, you can drop her into the spikes so you can get a second ahead of her. So there are ways you can kind of mess with each other, and that's one of the things we found in a co-op competitive game like this where you have rare loot, where you have gems you have to pick up for buying the loot, that people, particularly the ones that know each other more, will screw with each other more. And it's something that you can leverage each other's strengths, better at puzzles or better at combat to get through the different situations, and then you can kind of, like that run out you saw, mess with each other on the way out, like, aha, uh -huh, I got there first, oh, I got the higher score. So we love encouraging that kind of gameplay and letting people play the way they want. Sure. So all this uh, Chris Plant murdering I'm doing, is that having any negative effect on him? Beyond just slowing him down? No, it's actually, it's a, matter, it's a matter of just causing him some grief or some trouble. Certainly when you respawn, there's a like cost to it, so you could actually lose a little bit of the loot you may have picked up, but we try and make it as friendly as possible in the way that we don't want people just online screaming with each other and saying, oh, this is no fun. You can make private matches, you can lock people out, you can kick people out if you're not having fun with them, and that's whether it's local co-op or online, so we give players control over that kind of stuff. Now, one of the themes of the show that we've been talking to pretty much every developer about is actually having women characters in your video game. We you do, actually. Have, have yeah, a yeah. Why do you think that's important to have, you know, not just another white dude in your game? Well, yeah, so certainly from us, the diversity of both the player types and just the industry itself is one of the things that we love seeing the shift. We love seeing that strong female character. As you guys know, you know, Rihanna's our writer, even having a strong female writer who knows how to write for a strong female character, that stuff is imp just absolutely pertinent and powerful for us to be able to get the right messaging out there. There are tons of women gamers, right? There's at least as many of them out there that people want to downplay the value. I think it's crazy. It's like everybody wants to play. There are millions of people who haven't played games before until, oh, I played Angry Birds, whatever it is. Now that's that gateway drug that gets them in to playing other games and game experiences. So we want the broadest community we can possibly get. Every one of them play games. Something like this as a co-op game. Look at the three of us sitting here on the couch, right? We can easily yeah. see my wife joining us. She and I play co-op games all together. So I think that's the kind of stuff we want is we want that community. That's perfect. Uh, that's such a good quote. Sorry. Just mentioning your wife, it's like, ah, oh, it's perfect. It's like what I want every <laughs> game developer in my family to be. Like, that's what I, I love that idea of like being able to play with people I care about and not feel like I'm like totally ostracizing. Yeah, exactly right. Be able to sit feeling. on the couch with somebody that you know and you love and say, yep, let's go play Borderlands together as co-op. I mean, let's go play Lara Croft and Temple of Osiris together as co-op. 
what, what better life can you have? It's great. Um, one other question before we wrap up. Uh, it felt to me like Guardians of Light, and we kind of talked about this right before the show, yeah. was sort of a reboot just for the entire studio at Crystal Deep. Yeah. That seemed like the point where it was refreshing and it was taking Lara in a kind of different way. And I'm curious what internally, if that was perceived that way or what it was like uh, kind of from that point onward. Yeah, I think that's a great way to look at it. Like, certainly Daryl Gallagher taking over the studio was looking for a way to say, how do we reintroduce Lara Croft? How do we reintroduce Crystal as a studio going from, okay, they've been carrying and caretaking this franchise for a while to, oh my God, Crystal's back and Lara is back in a big way and having that precursor in 2010 for Lara and saying, oh my gosh, this is really cool. And people were still like, yeah, we'll wait and see. We don't know what's going to happen with Tomb Raider. And then we saw what happened with Tomb Raider. Coming into this E3, people were now like, oh my God, what's Crystal going to do next? You know, we can't wait to see what they're going to do. And I think that change of tone from we're not sure about the studio to I can't wait to see what they do next. And then having the one-two punch of the first day of the show, you know, we've had a very, very good ride getting to this point. That's fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us. It oh, it's absolutely chatting. my pleasure. Um, and thank you for joining us, everybody. We are going to be here for the rest of the week. Uh, you can find us on Polygon.com, or if you want some videos, we're also on YouTube.com forward slash Polygon. Until next time, we will see you later. <laughs> <laughs>